During the 70s and 80s, Ireland was going through a really rough patch in its history, which was known as the Troubles. The rise in terrorism from groups such as the Provisional IRA and the UVF kept the authorities on both sides of the Irish border on edge. However, there was another epidemic that was giving the Irish authorities grief. Organised crime. A very, very distracted police force meant that the Irish criminal underworld was able to flourish, particularly in Ireland's most deprived urban areas. And it's from one of these areas that a criminal legend was born. A man who tried his hardest to never ever let the public see his face. A man both loved and feared by his own gang. A man so precise in pulling off his crimes that he earned an iconic nickname. Martin Cahill, better known as The General. But before we get into the mad lad, a big thank you to Private Internet Access for sponsoring this video. I have all the time in the world for VPNs because they are very pro-internet freedom and very anti-censorship. In my line of work, people send me articles all the time and I'm always worried that one of these might be an IP grabber. So before I click the link, I always flick my VPN on to keep myself safe. I also use PIA to access the American Netflix because it's so much better and if you want us to stop doing that then stop making the American Netflix better. It also works with Hulu, Amazon Prime, Disney Plus and it lets the Yanks access the BBC. Private Internet Access is a leading no-log VPN service with 20,000 servers in 70 countries and dedicated apps across platforms like Windows, Mac, iOS, Android Amazon Fire Stick and Linux that you can use to connect up to 10 devices. It is also PC Mag's Editor's Choice VPN. There are multiple payment options like PayPal and Bitcoin, it has a kill switch button and most importantly there is absolutely no logging. So click my link down below to get private internet access for 2 years plus an extra 3 months for free at only $2.59 a month with a 30 day money back guarantee. Show them some love. Click the link. Martin Cahill was born on the 23rd of May, 1949. He grew up in a slum town in the northern part of Dublin, which was notorious for its poverty and violent crime. His dad was a low income lighthouse keeper, but would end up having 15 children. Catholics, man. I'm allowed to make that joke. I'm allowed to make that joke. I can say Fenian. I can say Tig. Those are our words. Martin's father would spend the small amounts of money that he made all on alcohol. Meaning that the rest of the family had to scrape by just to eat. Eventually, Cahill's brothers got so desperate that they would steal food from markets just to feed themselves and the rest of the family. And it is here that Martin would begin his life of crime, helping his brothers steal food from the age of eight. He also constantly skipped school because the teachers would routinely beat and humiliate him in front of his classmates. Thus, Cahill would focus on his true calling in life, which was to pickpocket pedestrians, steal from markets and burgle houses in the dead of night. He would get caught repeatedly by the Irish police, known locally as the Gardaí. But this didn't make him stop. Instead, it encouraged him to learn from his mistakes and become a much more cunning and talented thief. 
he would receive his very first criminal conviction at the age of just 12 years old. This isn't to say that he never tried to find legitimate work though. When he was 15 years old, Martin tried to apply for a position in the UK's Royal Navy. When he was given the application form, he was asked to select which of the listed positions he wanted to apply for. Skipping school uh, clearly didn't do Martin much good because he apparently misread the word bugler. You know, like the military personnel who play the bugle. Martin thought that it said burglar. So just imagine, if you will, being a highly respected British naval officer. I mean, you've probably served in the war and you are looking for the next generation of skilled sailors. Then imagine listening to some Irish teenager bragging for 10 minutes about how good and proficient he is at breaking into houses and stealing stuff. Needless to say, the Royal Navy rejected him and Martin returned to his life of crime. The next year, Martin gets thrown in jail for a string of burglaries. A guardy officer convinced Cahill to admit to his crimes, possibly to reduce the severity of his punishment. The court then ordered that he be sent to a Catholic reform school for two years, from 1965 to 1967. And his treatment there was apparently so bad that he would forever hold a burning resentment for the Gardaí and he would never ever again admit to any crime. Despite this, Martin's time at reform school would actually prove useful as he was able to make valuable connections with future partners in crime. Their shared hatred for the authorities allowed them to build up a fierce loyalty with one another, which would be essential for Cahill in his future plans. Upon his release at the age of 18, Martin would eventually meet and marry a girl called Frances Lawless. Lawless. You couldn't get a more fitting name for Cahill's wife if you tried. But even in his relationships, Cahill would go out of his way to buck the social norm. As well as being attracted to Francis, he also quite liked her sister, Tina. So instead of having to choose between them, he decided to just keep going out with both of them. He would go on to have nine children between the two lawless sisters, though he would eventually get two separate houses for both sets of families, the three of them were known to very often share the same bed. Martin and his brothers quickly began ramping up their criminal activities by looting warehouses. One of Martin's old contacts from reform school, who now had a job driving delivery vans, would scope out particularly vulnerable locations for the gang to hit. This system went rather well up until Cahill was eventually caught and given his first major prison sentence. He would be in jail from the 19th of March 1970 to the 25th of January 1973. And very much like reform school, Martin would always use his time in jail to establish new contacts and recruit potential gang members. So for Martin, prison was less of a punishment and more like a state-imposed LinkedIn session. After his time in jail, Martin discovered that his brothers were now working with another crime family called the Duns, taking part in armed robberies and taking even bigger scores. Martin jumped on the opportunity to be shown the ropes and he got into his first major heist on the 18th of November 1974. This involved raiding a bank security transit van which made frequent stops on a singular route. When the driver was just about to return to the van, a woman pushing a pram had suddenly appeared next to him. But it turns out that this was no caring mother cradling a baby in her arms. It was actually one of the gang members 
an address. And it also wasn't a baby he was holding in his arms. It was a disguised sawn-off shotgun. The gang member aimed his weapon at the men inside the van and said that he would shoot them if they didn't get out. After they got out, the gang then quickly looted the van, getting away with up to a million euros in today's money. This was actually the biggest cash heist in Irish history at this point, and when investigation started to take place, Martin managed to get away with his part in the robbery because of the lack of evidence against him. However, despite all of the successes the Cahills and Duns had achieved together, tensions started building between the two crime families. Martin had actually been a complete teetotaler for his entire life, purely from witnessing his dad throwing away all of his money and neglecting his family because of alcohol. So when the Duns started up their own drug ring, Martin wanted absolutely nothing to do with it. And this created a rift within the gang. The split finally occurred when the two families had completed a jewellery heist with the Cahills not receiving their fair share of the loot because it had apparently went missing. Martin had suspected that this was just an excuse to shortchange them, and so he decided to form his own gang in 1975. From here, Martin would plan and coordinate intricate heists and robberies with almost military precision. In fact, he would drill the gang so thoroughly before a heist that his henchmen started calling him by his iconic nickname, The General. The General would always make sure that he had at least one major take a week. This would involve either hitting small town banks, stealing factory payslips, or raiding bank security vans. Martin was known for being completely restless in his passion for stealing. Former gang members would actually report that even if they had just pulled off a major heist, the general would still go out every night and burgle people's houses just for the thrill of it. In fact, Martin was actually quite a strange guy, even for the standards of Irish criminals. Far from being a toned, athletic cat burglar, the general was short, fat and going bald. And he would very often wear worn jeans and stained t-shirts in his off time, despite the vast wealth that he had gathered from his criminal activities. Also, unlike other organised criminals who want to do everything they can to fly under the radar, the general would actually go out of his way to make a deliberate effort to antagonise and humiliate the authorities whenever he could. Instead of purchasing firearms from foreign gun runners, the general would intentionally raid Garde armories full of confiscated weaponry. This was to be seen as some sort of ironic gesture whenever he used these same weapons in an armed robbery. This man was such a good criminal that he was able to rob police stations. He would even go much further than this in 1976 and in 1979, where he would raid the Werberg Street Labour Exchange. That's right, he hit it twice. He hit the same place twice. The Labour Exchange is where many people in Dublin collected their benefits from and it was located just off of the main Gardaí headquarters and the General would secure a total of £125,000 in cash from both of these robberies with the Gardaí failing to catch him on both occasions. However, the General was not impervious to getting caught and he was once again sent to prison. He would serve a four-year sentence from 1977 
1980 for stealing vehicles with the intent to use them in an armed robbery. Whilst the general was serving his sentence, the troubles in Northern Ireland were really beginning to escalate. This, consequently, distracted the Irish authorities away from the problems of organised crime, which suited the general perfectly. By the time he was released, the general was able to quickly rebuild his influence and recruit up to 30 hardened criminals into his new platoon. Between 1980 and 1982, the general managed to steal around £400,000 worth of cash and assets. However, this was no longer enough to satisfy him, and throughout the mid-80s, he wanted to find a way to secure a once-in-a-lifetime payday. His first attempt at this was the O'Connor's jewellery heist. Thomas O'Connor and Sons were a jewellery factory in Dublin, which supplied jewellery shops throughout the country with very high-end and very expensive jewellery. Fortunately for the general, he already had an insider at the factory. His gang were frequently meeting with an employee there who would smuggle out gold dust and uncut jewels to sell off to the gang, and both parties would make thousands from simply selling the raw gold and diamonds alone. The general was soon convinced of the massive amounts of money that could be made from a successful raid of the factory. So he dedicated half a year into planning every small detail of the operation. When everything was finalised, the general decided to strike on the 16th of July 1983. This was the best time for the general because most of the staff would be on holiday, which would make crowd control a lot easier and also reduce the chances of someone contacting the guardy. On the evening before the robbery, the general's men broke into a boiler house located next to the factory where they began to prepare for the morning's raid. The general would remain on a nearby hill to coordinate the men via radio and to also be on the lookout for any nearby guard patrols. When morning came and the manager had turned off the factory's security systems, the general signalled his men to start storming the building and to begin lifting as much jewellery as possible. It took around 35 minutes for the men to completely fill up their modified getaway cars with jewellery and for the whole heist the guardy were never alerted once and the men were able to make a completely clean getaway and they had managed to steal 10 and a half million euros worth of jewellery. This heist would prove to be another record-breaking moment for the general, as it was recorded as being the largest jewellery heist ever in Irish history at the time. The financial hit to the O'Connor's factory was actually so bad that they were forced to close later in the year, which cost over a hundred workers their jobs. Unfortunately, instead of swimming in Scrooge McDuck-sized pools of cash, the general could only sell the jewellery for a fraction of what it was worth, on account of the jewellery being, what's the criminal term, too hot. He would end up only making around £200,000 from the entire haul. Ironically, he would have probably made more money from just selling the uncut gems and gold dust that he was getting, which he now couldn't get anymore because the factory was forced to close. It was during this saga that the general revealed his more ruthless side. A courier responsible for smuggling the jewellery to a London buyer for £40,000 was actually raided by the London police. However, because the courier wasn't heard from in two weeks, Martin thought that he had just ran off with the money. So when the courier returned to Dublin, the general tortured him by crucifying him to the floor. After 
several hours of driving nails through the courier's hands, the general was finally convinced that he didn't steal the money and delivered him to a nearby hospital. Well, that was nice of him. The general, however, was still desperate to score the big take. So, eventually, he got the idea to raid a prominent private art collection located at a place called Rusborough House. Rusborough House was bought and renovated by a former Conservative MP called Sir Alfred Beat. He primarily used the house to store his many rare paintings that he had collected over the years, and by the 80s, Sir Beat had actually opened up the house as a public gallery for everyone to appreciate his art collection. The general cased the gallery for two months, studying the alarm system, the routes of entry, and deciding which of the paintings he wanted to steal. And by the 21st of May 1986, he was finally ready to undertake the second biggest art heist in the world. In the dead of night, the general and his men approached the gallery and began to remove one of the window panes. The general then deliberately set off the infrared sensors and quickly disabled them before jumping back out and replacing the window pane. This was a deliberate tactic to trick the housekeeper into thinking that it was just a false alarm and it also allowed the general to actually get inside and switch the alarm off so it wouldn't go off again when he re-entered. So after the Garde had finished a light patrol around the area, the general and his men simply removed the pane again and went back inside and started removing 11 paintings from the gallery. And that was that. The general managed to steal £20 million worth of paintings without so much as breaking a sweat. He stored the paintings in a secret location in the Dublin mountains and he waited for the cash to start flowing in. Unfortunately, very much like the O'Connor's heist, though he stole what would have been millions of pounds worth of paintings, their value on the black market would be next to worthless. That is, if he was ever lucky enough to actually sell any of the paintings, because just like with the O'Connor's heist, the merchandise was far too hot. International police were put on such high alert after the art house theft that it became basically impossible for the general to actually even sell the paintings without getting caught. His men even came to believe that the paintings were actually cursed because of the sheer amount of bad luck they had had in trying to get rid of them. All 11 paintings would eventually be returned to the gallery after successful sting and seizure operations throughout the years. However, these high-profile raids meant that the general began attracting unwanted attention from the Garde. This began in 1981, where Martin was once again charged with an armed robbery. The typical way that the general would deal with this problem would be to send his men to raid the court building in the middle of the night and steal the case files and all of the evidence which incriminated him. The most daring job said to be done by this gang took place last August at the offices of the Director of Public Prosecutions. It was an astonishing breach of security. The gang stole more than a hundred files. They included 16 major armed robberies, assault and drug cases, the O'Connor jewellery file, the MacArthur and Patrick Cahill murders, the Jennifer Guinness kidnap. However, he soon discovered that this tactic was not going to work because of one man, Dr. James Donovan. Donovan was one of Ireland's top forensic scientists and his work as an expert witness had actually already sent a lot of the general's men to jail. The development of forensic science had posed a serious threat to the general's future plans. 
And thus, the general decided that Donovan had to die. The general hired a member of the Irish National Liberation Army to construct a car bomb for him. The INLA, for those who don't know, were basically the socialist branch of the IRA. Well, at least they were back then. Nowadays, all of the IRA is socialist. The general's aim was for Donovan's death to interrupt the forensic investigation into his robberies and also to ultimately pin the assassination onto the IRA, who were infamous for this type of murder at the time. The first assassination attempt commenced on the 24th of November 1981. Thankfully, the bomb had failed to properly detonate and only resulted in minor damage being done to Donovan's car. The second attempt actually worked as far as the bomb actually being detonated this time, but it still failed to kill Donovan. Unfortunately, it did permanently disfigure him and left him in a lot of pain for the rest of his life. Despite these two assassination attempts, Donovan would bravely continue to appear in the general's court cases where he was now being charged with attempted murder on top of the original armed robbery cases. Ironically, Martin was acquitted on both charges because of a lack of forensic evidence and also some legal technicalities employed by his lawyers. This meant that killing Donovan would have been absolutely pointless and did nothing but attract more public and guardy attention to the infamous general. By 1987, the guardy had finally had enough of the general's antics, so they commissioned their serious crime squad to deal with him. They decided that the best approach was to place the general and his top accomplices on 24-hour surveillance, manned by a dedicated team of Guardi officers. They would be known colloquially as the Tango Squad, as they had issued each target with the codename Tango. The general was referred to as Tango One. On New Year's Day of 1988, the general and his men had awoken to swarms of Guardi officers surrounding their homes and found themselves being constantly followed by unmarked police cars. The officers would deliberately sit right next to them in pubs and conduct constant stop and frisk searches on them. Their aim was to drive the criminals so mad that they would either quit organised crime altogether or make a mistake which would land them in jail. However, this soon turned ugly as the general responded by sending his men to intimidate members of the Tango Squad and he also hired thugs to actually ram their police cars off the road. The Garde also caught on to rumours that the general was planning to assassinate the officer in charge of the Tango Squad which required him to be put under constant armed protection. Though the operation wouldn't land the general himself in jail, the Tango Squad did succeed in locking up a lot of his top accomplices and also forced many of his other gang members to quit, which severely reduced the general's ability to pull off big heists like he had before. Journalists began reporting on the general's exploits in late 1987, but would eventually get to land their very first interview with him in 1988. An RTE programme called The Today Tonight Show had decided to conduct a 40-minute documentary on the general and his criminal history. The TV crew was driven around by the Tango Squad, who revealed that Martin owned two properties. One was a house in an upper-middle-class area that he bought for his wife, and a council house which her sister lived in. The journalists managed to stop the general on his way back home from collecting his benefits. <laughs> the cheeky bastard. And they attempted to get to know as much as they could 
about the general. All right, you're Martin Cahill, right? Yeah. You live in 21 Swan Grove? Yeah, I do, yeah. yeah. Right. There are guys sitting outside your house in cars every morning. Yes, I never see them. 24 hours a day, between their cover downs and wherever you go. I don't know. Never see them. Serious, no, I don't see them. Though. Right, Martin, right. Like I, why does everybody, i.e. the guards and criminal people, say Martin Cahill is the general? Never. No one ever said it to me. Well, I'm, no, saying, no, no, I'm no. saying that that's what people say. You've seen it in the papers. You've seen it, you know, you've seen it published. No, 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 no. It must, be, it must be someone else. It must be another Martin Cahill somewhere. <laughs> Right, okay, there might be <laughs> Now, if you couldn't understand any of that, I'm not subtitling it, tough titty, stop being racist, but this interview did establish the General's public persona where he would hide his face as much as possible and come across as quite the joker. Also, the whole wearing a ski mask during interviews thing became quite a big meme with the general. He would go on to even wear balaclavas in public, and at one point he also wore a pair of those joke shop glasses to court, which the judge was very unhappy with. The general would have fun with the media whenever he made a TV appearance, probably as an attempt to get the public on his side. Seven Border witnesses gave evidence and the case was adjourned. Martin Cahill then left the court where he handed out a statement. And then, to the astonishment of reporters, he began to do a small jig from you and removed his trousers. Mickey Mouse! Mr. Cahill was then arrested but later released. Shortly after, he gave this interview to RTE. Despite the increased public awareness about the general, Martin would still go out and commit armed robberies, though not to the same scale as his earlier heists. By the turn of the 90s, Martin decided that he wanted to retire on a high note, as the Garde had eliminated most of his gang and he himself came closer to getting locked up. He decided to take on one last major heist in September of 1993, this time focusing on the National Irish Bank. The plan would be to abduct the bank's CEO and get him to withdraw a massive amount of cash. He would then hand this cash over to the general without it being traced back to him. The General successfully abducted the CEO and his wife on the 1st of November 1993 and they were being detained in an unknown location with another kidnapped victim who befriended them because, you know, they were in this together. But this other kidnapped victim was a plant. He was actually one of the General's henchmen put in there to gain the trust of the CEO. And this henchman was such a good method actor that he even agreed to take a bullet to the leg to terrify the CEO. Now that is dedication. After being frightened into submission, the CEO and the general's plant were told to go to the bank and withdraw money, while the CEO's wife stayed behind with the hostage takers as an insurance policy in case the CEO tried to pull something funny. So the CEO and the General's plant went to the bank where they were expected to withdraw millions of pounds in cash. However, the CEO was only able to withdraw £400,000. And although disappointed, the General's plant couldn't press the issue any further, otherwise he would blow his cover. After dropping the cash off, the three hostages, so including the General's plant, visited a nearby Garde station where they reported the kidnapping. The General had hoped that by putting his plant 
into the mix, he would be able to throw the scent away from him, through him, feeding the Gardi false information that wouldn't make them suspect the general. But this completely backfired, because during their investigation, the Gardi discovered that during the time that the general's henchman was, you know, being held hostage, he had somehow managed to repeatedly collect his dole money in person. This, this completely untangled the whole conspiracy, with the general being charged with kidnapping and extortion. Though he got released on bail shortly afterwards, this would be the general's last attempt at a big score. Though, not because he gave up. By 1994, the general had been slowly amassing a mountain of enemies, who all wanted him dead. The IRA commonly used fear tactics against criminal gangs in order to extort money from them to finance their operations. The general was pretty much the only gangster in Dublin to not bend the knee, and he repeatedly refused to share his loot with them. However, the real turning point was when the general tried to sell some of his infamous stolen paintings off to the Ulster Volunteer Force. Now, the UVF was a Northern Irish terrorist group who fought against the IRA to keep Northern Ireland in the United Kingdom. And though the general didn't care who bought the paintings, he just wanted the money, he was assumed to be a UVF accomplice by the IRA from that point on. And that was a very bad position to be in. The IRA would call for the general's death when the UVF claimed responsibility for a shooting at a Sinn Féin fundraiser on the 21st of May 1991. Sinn Féin are the Irish political party which are associated with the IRA. Technically, they, they are the IRA, at least they're made up of the old members of the IRA, it's complicated. Typically, if you are already in the firing line of one terrorist group, you should probably try your best not to piss off another one. But that is exactly what the general did. Despite having worked together in the past, the ILNA had developed a hatred for Martin in 1992, a member of the General's gang had forced himself upon the 14-year-old daughter of an INLA lieutenant, and instead of just throwing him to the wolves, the General attempted to stick up for the guy by trying to bribe and intimidate the family into not pressing charges. That's not a good look. Even some of his own men were getting nervous as the general was demanding cuts from drug rings or heists that he had nothing to do with. Other criminal gangs purely out of a commercial taking out the competition interest also wanted to be rid of the general, leaving Martin dangerously isolated and without any friends to watch over him. It's believed that the general was becoming gradually more unhinged as a result of his worsening and untreated diabetes, which would explain the more rash decisions that he would make later on in his life. On the 18th of August, 1994, a hitman disguised himself as a traffic surveyor and waited at a junction that the general would often drive through. After stopping the general, the assassin took out his revolver and shot the general repeatedly in the head and torso, killing him instantly. The assassin then made his getaway on a motorbike. The IRA would claim sole responsibility for the general's death, though most investigators believe that the INLA and other criminal gangs 
were actually working together to conduct the assassination. The General's unique story and complex personality have made him a huge subject of interest in Irish popular culture. He's been featured in three films and has had countless books and dramas written about him. In 2008, the General's eldest daughter released a book called My Father, attempting to get people to see the General's good side, as she put it. I mean, I'm all for fair representation, but I think the charity for that stuff kind of goes right out the door when you're car bombing people or sticking up for beasts. In general, Martin Cahill still lives on as a legend in the history of organised crime in Ireland. Though he made a lot of enemies at the end of his life, he is still pretty much revered by many Irish gangsters and his name still haunts many of his former victims. He has been described as being very instrumental in the rise of organised crime in Ireland, with many gangs being able to trace some parts of their origins back to the general himself. So you could say that Martin Cahill was more than just a gang leader. He was one of the founding godfathers. But anyway, like and subscribe and nobody gets hot. It's Count Dankula on YouTube! Everybody subscribe!